Good afternoon. Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Cheryl, and I'd like to welcome you to today's History Speaks. Um, today we have uh, Larry Jorgensen, who's going to be presenting. Um, he has a long history in media, having worked in television news and also as a newspaper publisher. And he uh, has an affinity to Mich Michigan's Upper Peninsula, which as a lighthouse fanatic, I do as well. <laughs> so it is this fascination that led to him authoring the book that he is going to discuss today. Um, if you wouldn't mind silencing any cell phones, we would really appreciate that. And one more thing I wanted to say was that we would like to acknowledge our sponsor, uh, Yonke Bookstore, for faithfully year after year uh, sponsoring this program. So, yeah. Thank you, Jane and Jim. So, okay, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Larry. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> they uh, tell me it's working. Is it working? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Well, it's wonderful to be here in Wausau. I'm a wonderful looking crowd. Nothing, nothing else to do on a Saturday afternoon, so we'll go listen to this guy talk about a shipwreck, I guess. Um, I'm Larry Jorgensen, as Cheryl just told you, and um, have a lot of Wisconsin history, uh, although I'm not living here full time now, but uh, believe me, when it's, when it's uh, comfortable here and too warm in the south, I'm in Wisconsin. Uh, the story, it, it's kind of interesting because of all the shipwrecks that have been on, on Lake, the Great Lakes, and there's been 6,000 of them. There has never been a single shipwreck and rescue like this story of the, we call it shipwrecked and rescued. And the rescue part is what makes it so unique to other shipwreck stories. Um, obviously one of the most famous is the Edmund Fitzgerald, but fortunately we have a happy ending to our story. And the Edmund Fitzgerald did not. But both of them have in common Lake Superior, November. The worst time in the world to be on Lake Superior is in November. Um, the the um, story actually starts out in Detroit, where a company that uh, had a fleet of steamers that primarily hauled cars. Uh, you know, in those days, you didn't have the big roads to accommodate semi-loads of, of cars being hauled from manufacturer to distributor, etc. cetera. And uh, it was pretty common uh, when they could reach a port that would have destination to car retailers to send the cars on a steamer up the Great Lakes. And that was the case here. Um, it left uh, Detroit in November of 1926. It had 240 brand new Chryslers. Now brand new as in 1927, right? So they, they were able to get up into Lake Superior. Now, one of the things that, that added to the problem the ship originally had been built to carry iron ore and to carry grain and commodities. So obviously it had the hatches on top where you'd drop product in and it was designed for heavy loads. Well, when this company in Detroit started hauling uh, cars, they would buy a ship and they would redesign it. They would make the top deck level, eliminate the holes. Uh, they'd build a second level on the lower, lower uh, deck to accommodate the cars. But also what happened, even when it was full, the ship would ride higher than it would if it was loaded with iron ore. That makes sense. So that added to the problem when they got into Lake Superior and they got into this tremendous storm. The, the captain of the ship, he said, oh, I've, I've had many ships in Lake Superior and I'm not afraid of it. 
After the storm, he said it was without a doubt the worst storm he had ever experienced. Um, so what happens? They, they get in the storm and it gets so violent, it begins to toss the ship sideways. They lose the rudder, lose complete control, and the ship is tossed onto a reef. It's gashed, badly gashed, and it's, it's on this reef about a mile and a half, two miles from the closest shore. So we have a crew that uh, is stranded on a ship, and we have 200 and some Chryslers. Now, when it got into that, that violent storm, the cars on the top deck were all chained in rows, and they would have a common chain for each row. The, the chain would be at one end, they would run down the row of maybe 13 cars, and then each car would be chained to that, that main chain. Well, what happened when they got into the storm, the, the chain of cars that was on the outside and got tossed the worst, the chain broke, and there are today 13 Chryslers on the bottom of Lake Superior. The, re the rest of them stayed put and they did crash on the reef. Um, so we've got them on the reef and we've got a crew of 29 guys and now what? Well, they were able to get a lifeboat chopped free from the deck and they used the lifeboat to kind of ferry the crew back and forth to the land. So they get them to, they get them to shore, they finally get them all to shore and uh, these guys are from Detroit. Some of them think this, they're going on a, a, a nice little venture, a little cruise. And, and there's some of them that are dressed very lightweight. Some of them even have loafers on. They're not at all equipped for what they're about to run into four feet of snow on the Keweenaw Peninsula. So they get them ashore. Now, they're not a lot of them are not prepared for this in clothing. The other thing, they're lost. The, when the ship got into the storm, the captain thought, have any, of, have any of you been up to the Copper Harbor, to that area? So you're probably familiar with Brockway Mountain. And the captain had thought, in the storm he thought, they had gone by Brockway Mountain. He thought he had seen it. So the crew gets off the ship and they thought, okay, we need, to, we need to walk east to get to Copper Harbor if there's any chance of being saved at all. Now, no communications in those days. No one knows that the ship has been wrecked on a reef. They're just out there on their own. So they proceed to start walking to the east. Well, the fact of the matter is, they were already east. The ship had crashed on a reef east of Copper Harbor. So they walked for many hours until they realized that's not what they should be doing. And they turn around and they backtrack. And so that first day they get as far as back to the, where they can see the ship. Next day they take off and continue to walk to the west. Um, but it's very deep, snow is up to four feet deep. We got cold temperatures um, and they're really having a hard time. A lot of them are convinced that they will not see the next day. And they continue to plot along. Well, what happens, and because of this particular Coast Guard captain, you're gonna see some wonderful pictures in the book. Um, but it so happens there was a second ship that went aground on the kind of the east, southeast side of Keweenaw Peninsula. And two of the crew members from that ship were able to walk about six miles and believe it or not, found a working telephone and called the Coast Guard Rescue Station, which was in Eagle Harbor. So the, the Coast Guard uh, rescue boat takes off looking for this crew that is called in. They, they go, the storm is still so bad, they sail right by 
the, the ship, which by the way is called the Banger, and I'll, I'll tell you a while why it's called the Banger. Uh, it wasn't from Maine. Um, so the captain sails right down by, doesn't even see the ship. Picks up this crew from the second stranded uh, crew, is bringing them to Copper Harbor. Well, and as he's coming back, he finally sees the ship. So he pulls in, nobody there, obviously. So he's, well, okay, they continue on. Well, he gets a, a couple hours further towards Copper Harbor, and there's a little bay. And he sees in the bay, here is what's left of this crew struggling through the snow. Um, a lot of them are really, really hurting at this point. They, they're not dressed for it and so forth. So he pulls into the harbor and he hails to the crew. He says, build a fire. I will come back and rescue you. So he takes his first crew to Copper Harbor. Now, if you've been to Copper Harbor, you, you, even now you know this is not a great metropolis. And the, there is no Holiday Inn, you know. So he dumps the first batch off, goes back and gets the second batch. And he was smart enough when he left Copper Harbor, he towed behind his rescue boat a smaller boat. So he gets into this bay where the guys have built a fire, and he takes a smaller boat to, to shore, and trip at a time, he finally gets the entire crew into the Coast Guard ship, gets them back to Copper Harbor. So now we have 50-some stranded, some of them in very bad condition, uh, crewmen in Copper Harbor, population probably three dozen at that time, I don't know. Certainly not a good place for accommodations. Um, so in the book, I'm gonna, and I'll tell you now how, how they were saved. First we get to the rescue of the crew, but I was gonna tell you about why it was called the Banger. When the ship was first built, there was a very wealthy businessman who was originally from Bangor, Maine, who had moved to Michigan. And he financed the building of this ship, which was called the City of Bangor, and he financed at the same time the building of another ship, which was called Penobscot. And in the book, we mention also what happened to Penobscot. Um, both to be just common carriers or grain, whatever was going. Um, after he'd had the two ships for about almost 20 years, they were purchased to become cargo, I mean, to become uh, car carriers. And so they transitioned. The, the banger, in fact, was actually um, taken to a ship repair yard south of Chicago, was cut in half, and they put another 50 feet in the middle, made it even longer. And of course, they, you know, they made the top deck uh, usable for car hauling and lower deck, elevator, the whole, the whole thing. So anyhow, back to the story about the crew. The crew is now in Copper Harbor. Where do we put them? Um, the captain of the Coast Guard ship decides that he can take the first crew over to Eagle Harbor to the Coast Guard rescue station. And they weren't in, in, in near bad a condition. So he did that. Meanwhile, what about the other 29 guys from this ship? Well, it's so, and you're in Copper Harbor. Now this is November, 1926. You know, if you've driven to Copper Harbor, even in the summer, the road isn't the, you know, we're not talking an interstate highway. Well, you can imagine in 1926, they didn't plow that road. No thoughts of plowing that road. And in some places, the snow would be six, eight feet high. So now we have 29 crewmen in Copper Harbor, some of them really in bad shape. A family there, the Berg family, says, we'll take them in. Now, it was less than a quarter of a mile from the dock in Copper Harbor to where this family lived, but it was all they could do for that crew to walk that quarter of a mile 
to that family's home. The story about the family, by the way, I interviewed, you talk about, I got hung up on this story. I was fortunate enough to interview the, the granddaughter of the Bergs, who now lives in Indiana, but they have a summer home up on Lake Medora. And she came up and told me a lot of what's written in the book, how the family actually saved the lives of these crewmen who were in so bad shape. It said, she told me, she said, you know, Grandpa had just slaughtered two hogs. So they had pork, and she said, and they, their cow was known as the best producing cow in the area. And they had some chickens. So they had at least a way to, to provide food and heat the big stove in the living room for the crewmen. They finally get them in there. They literally fall asleep around the stove. And she mentioned, she said, uh, my, uh, it would have been her, her grandson, um, or no, her, <laughs> let me see, it would have been Mr. Berg's son. So yeah, it would have been her grandson because Mr. Berg was her great grand grandfather. Anyhow, his job, and he was just a little squirt at that time, his job was to mop up the water as the guys began to thaw out. So, so in the meantime, the, the, some of these guys are hurting pretty bad. The, co the guy from the Coast Guard captain is able to call ahead to Lorium, to the hospital in Lorium. And he gets a hold of the doctor there and he says, doctor, we are in bad shape up here. We've got some, some crewmen that really need quick attention. Well, it so happens that an auto dealer in Lorium, Calumet, had developed one of these track deals on an old Model T. Wasn't sure it was gonna work or not, but let's try it. And so he takes the doctor, they go up to Copper Harbor and they, are, they begin to rescue the, the, the crew members that are hurt the most, take them back to the hospital in Lorium. And then the others, little by little, by sleigh, are taken also to the hospital in Lorium. And, and many of them stayed there for several months. Um, interesting story that I was not able to track down the truth to it, but I, I would believe it would have happened. They said some of those crewmen who stayed there so long that they found that some of the nurses were really to their liking. <laughs> and uh, there were some that never went back to their hometown. They became Keweenaw residents. <laughs> I wish I could have found a descendant of, that would have been a good story, but I couldn't find anyone that would volunteer that. So we finally get all the crew to the hospital in Lorium. Now we still have an abandoned boat loaded with Chryslers sitting on a reef off of Copper Harbor. Well, you know, Walter Chrysler had come up and had looked at that mess and realized with the help of his insurance adjuster that there was no saving the boat. It was gone. So Walter says, I want my cars back. He hires a salvage company out of Duluth and they work a deal. He said, I'll give you X amount of money for every car you can get back to me in Detroit. Okay, well that, that was not an easy, easy challenge for this company. What they do is they wait, now remember the wreck was in November. They wait until January and the ice by then has frozen around the reef. Uh huh, okay. So, and you'll see in the book there's a picture of how they were able to get the cars off of the ship and onto the reef, step number one. So they get them onto the reef, then what? Well, the ice is frozen again enough that they can get them ashore. Same way, same direction that the crew went, but a couple months later. So they, get, they start to get the cars to shore, and someone says, well, what we'll do is we'll just, we'll build a road to Copper Harbor. It's only eight miles. 
you know. Now, this is November, and the snow is, you know. That idea lasts for about a mile. And somebody else who was thinking a little bit sharper says, wait a minute. The ice is also frozen along the shore. Why don't we drive the cars along the shore of Lake Superior, and we'll get them in that way? So that's the plan. Little by little, they get them off of the ship. They start driving them along the shore to Copper Harbor. Again, not an easy task. These cars have sat on there. Now again, this is 1927, okay? They've sat there for a couple months. Some of them, the batteries are completely dead. Others have no batteries at all. So the ones that they were able to start they would drive to Copper Harbor, and then they would relay the good batteries back to the ship, and they'd drive a few more into Copper Harbor. Eventually, and there's a great picture in the book where you, if you've been to Copper Harbor and you know a lighthouse, there's a picture of the, of the uh, cars going along the shore, and there's the Copper Harbor lighthouse in the background. Where did all these pictures come from? Another story. The uh, Coast Guard captain was an amateur photographer, and he fell in love with the whole thing. He just thought, in fact, he, they say he drove one of the first cars to Copper Harbor. So needless to say, he took a lot of pictures. He took pictures of the cars coming off the boat, uh, pictures of them coming along the uh, lakeshore, and on the back and elsewhere in the book, there's this great picture of 200 and some Chryslers in Calumet. I mean, in Copper Harbor, not in Calumet yet. They're in Copper Harbor. Now you think about 1927, 200 and some brand new Chryslers in a little community with a population of probably 30 some people. <laughs> not a good market for 200 and some Chryslers. Yeah. So they're all lined up. Now the, the next challenge, remember, Walter said, get the cars to me in Detroit, not in Copper Harbor. So I think, all right, we've got to clear that road. It's, all, it's almost 40 miles from Copper Harbor to Calumet. But in Calumet, there's a railroad depot. And you can get a flat car, you know, a train car, and you can put cars on it, plan. So they say, well, all we have to do is open that road. Now that road in 1927 isn't much of a road anyhow. And it's in some places like out around Lake Mendora, it's eight feet deep in snow. So the, there's two counties on Keweenaw and both county highway commissions start the task of trying to open that road. They worked for three weeks to plow through that snow on that road to Calumet. It got so bad as they got close to Calumet out by Lake Mendora, they actually were able to bring in one of these snowblower, turbine type snow, snow plows that they had somehow found out about. It was in Albert Lee, Minnesota. And they got it over to Calumet, got it on the road, and they finished it up because the, the, what they had just couldn't go any further. They get the road open. Now, we've still got 200 and some cars sitting in Copper Harbor. In the meantime, while they're plowing the roads open, you've got gasoline being hauled by sleigh to Copper Harbor so we can get the cars from Copper Harbor to Calumet to get him on a train, we hope. All right, so now what? The salvage company says, all right, the road is open. We will pay $5 a head for every person who will drive one of these cars from Copper Harbor to Calumet. A lot of high school boys didn't go to school that day. <laughs> so. The parade begins. They start to move the cars from, Calumet, from Copper Harbor to Calumet. Now, 
let's pretend that you're driving one of these cars. You're, you're going to get five dollars when you get to, when you get to Calumet. You're going to get five dollars, and you're driving a brand new Chrysler. Wow! And I'm going to get five dollars. Well, you know, as you get closer to Calumet, there are some side roads. You know, and as I began to research this book, I would hear stories about, well, you know, my great grandfather drove one of those cars, you know, it never made it to Calumet, you know, and, and uh, so we, f we found one. And we'll, the whole story about that one we found is in the book. That car stayed on the Keweenaw, and is still there today, by the way. Uh, the, the, it was handed down within a family. In fact, the first person who bought it was told this is from the Keweenaw, I mean from the, uh, the banger. And he had it for two years. He died, passed it on through his widow to his brother. Now his brother's name was Patty Slazarski, and Patty loved the car. He just, he drove it everywhere. He drove it in parades. He, anytime he could find a reason to drive it, he drove it. That car accumulated 200,000 miles. I hope my Ford, <laughs> where is Patty when I need him? Anyhow, so we have a picture in the book of Patty taking that car through the Michigan vehicle inspection guy, and he can't believe it. He said, that car and those miles and in that condition, he's just amazed. Well, finally, the car gets handed down and the last person that owns it, uh, a great-grandson, has a, a job he has to go to in Nina, Wisconsin. Probably making paper, I don't know what he's doing down there, but anyhow, so he, he can't take the car and to be honest about it, he's not too interested in it. A local real estate agent buys the car. He's convinced he can restore it, he'll make a lot of money. Well, after five years with that idea, he decides he wants to sell it. And the historical society in the Keweenaw Peninsula and a gentleman by the name of Mark Rowe who was their maritime historian, has fallen in love with this whole story. He had already accumulated pictures and, and ideas about it, and he found the car was available. The Historical Association raised the money to buy the car, and it sits to this day, if you go up to Eagle Harbor to the lighthouse, as you go down the hill to the lighthouse, there's a little museum on the left. And that car is in that museum. And you can see on it, there's an ax mark from where they cut the ice off of it to get it off the boat. Uh, there is also in that museum the captain's desk from the ship. He was able somehow to get that salvage off of the ship, gave it to the Berg family who saved his crew. They in turn have put it on permanent loan at the museum. There's also at the museum the logbook, logbook from that ship. And that logbook had been missing for about, I guess, 40, 50 years. And what had happened shortly after the accident, after the, the ship crashed on the reef, there was a couple who were out Sunday walk and this guy, and this is like the Sunday or maybe two years after the, the wreck. He sees a log and he kicks this log over and there's a book underneath it. He says, that's an interesting book. And he takes it home with him. He keeps it for several decades, not knowing really what he's got, until someone says, you've got the log book from the banger. Well, he wants it to go someplace. So he talks to the tourist commission, the tourist commission says, get it to the museum. 
and it ends up at the museum. So it's there. Uh, and there's some other, the captain's jacket is there and so forth. So um, it, it's, it, and he's got a lot of the pictures. Some of the pictures that are in my book are extended, they're larger, they're on the walls at the museum at Eagle Harbor. Um, those pictures, like I say, were taken by the captain of the Coast Guard ship only because they were saved and handed down and his granddaughter was able to provide access to them. Do they exist in the museum and do they exist in the book? Some fabulous photos. Um, I want to spin off a story for you about the Berg family. Um, after, uh, well, first of all, in the book, I've got a copy of a Christmas card. And I, I told you I met with the granddaughter of the Bergs. She came up one time on vacation and she had found a box that her grandmother had kept. And in the box, she showed me this, she pictures that, but she showed me this Christmas card. It was from the first mate of the Manger. And he had sent them a very lengthy card. It's like two, two pages, thanking them for saving his crewmates and wishing them a Merry Christmas, etc. She was gracious enough to let me copy that and include it in the book. And when you read it, you really you choke up about it because it, it's amazing that she kept it and we were allowed to read it afterwards. But anyhow, back to the story of the Bergs. And the, you know, that's the fun thing about this, this whole story. It goes in so many directions. It's not just a shipwreck, and it's not just a bunch of cars. It's how the whole peninsula, the Keweenaw Peninsula, got involved in this project. Uh, after the, the crew was saved, Mr. Berg ran for sheriff, and he was elected. So Mr. and Mrs. Berg moved to, to um, Eagle River, not Wisconsin, Michigan, where the county uh, courthouse, jail, etc., are, and he's the sheriff. She goes along and becomes the under sheriff, I guess we'd call her. Her her main job was to take care of the county jail. And again, a story from the granddaughter. She says, you know, especially in the winter time, if someone had committed a crime and was brought up before the judge, and he was offered to either pay the fine or go to jail. He'd usually go to jail because he knew Mrs. Berg was one heck of a good cook. <laughs> so one of the little pieces of information you get when you talk to relatives. The sad part, which then becomes a happy part, Mr. Berg was elected for a second term, re-elected. He was to begin his term in January in December, he had been out in a snowstorm helping someone whose car was stuck and he got pneumonia. He died within days after his term began. Well, guess who became the sheriff? Mrs. Berg. Not only did she become the sheriff, she ran for and was reelected two terms. She is in the state of Michigan. They have a, a, a listing of Michigan's most famous women. She's in it. <laughs> so again, it's how this little shipwreck story goes in so many directions. You know, we have the car that ends up in the museum after 200 miles. We have the Berg family who have, you could write a book about them. And it just, it's amazing where this little story has taken me as someone who wanted to write about it. Now, another part, we've got an abandoned ship. No cars, it's just sitting there on the reef. What are we gonna do about that? Well, it became a good tourist attraction. People would go out as far as they could go on shore and they'd see it and they'd take pictures. In the winter time, when it freezes over, you could even walk out to it. So it was, you know, kind of, let's go see, the, let's go see the, that old ship. 
Well, what happened along after 18 years, we get into World War II. And what do we need? Steel. Another salvage company gets involved, they get the rights to salvage the steel off of the banger. So they do, they go out there with cutting torches and explosives and whatever, and they get the banger completely cut down to the water level. The steel is hauled into um, Copper Harbor, piled up and later shipped off for war effort. There's pictures in the book of uh, it, it being done, of it being torn, torn apart, hauled away. Uh, so we've got the ship at that point down to the water level. It's still a little bit there. Well, as it turns out, there are two enterprising young loggers working in the woods, and they hear about this. Like, you know, there's still more steel out there. So in the book, there's a picture of this vehicle they concocted. It's like a high-rise truck with a big crane on the back of it and, and a big long chain and so forth. And so they say, okay, we can make more money salvaging what's left of that ship than we can cutting down these crazy trees. So out to the site they go and they proceed to do underwater cutting of the ship explosives, whatever, to get broken into pieces that they can drag the chain out, put it on the crane and drag the stuff in ashore. So what was left of the banger was then salvaged by, I guess we'd call it a midnight salvage crew. And they got, they got pretty much got it all. However, there are pieces, small pieces, that'll every once in a while turn up, you know, waves, wash the water out, whatever. And there are some small pieces at that museum. And occasionally somebody will find something and say, oh, that's from the banger. And so they'll end up over there. So again, you know, see how the story just goes in so many directions, so many people get involved. I, I think at the, at the back of the book, I was so moved by this whole thing that I wrote a little thing. And basically what I said was, everybody knows the saying, it takes a village. Well, in this situation, it took a peninsula. And if you're ever in trouble, the type of people that brave it out on the Keweenaw Peninsula winter and summer are a safe harbor when you're in trouble. They have no doubt about it. So that was um, just a feeling that I got in, in interviewing and talking with people about it. Um, I hope I've stirred up some interest for questions because I, I talk about this all afternoon, but Ben will probably cut me off, you know. But, but please feel free to ask questions. There's probably a lot of other things I haven't touched on that uh, will come to mind. So uh, have at it. Yes, sir. Well, you know, the time, how much was a brand new Chrysler? How much was what? Yeah, how much was a brand uh, well, they were advertising. We've got an ad in the book. Um, Seven, eight hundred dollars. Some of them were less, depending on the model. Uh, by the way, we didn't talk about. We said there were two hundred and forty Chryslers. There were also six Whippets. Anybody know what a Whippet is? It was a car that was made in Toledo, Ohio. The company that made it is was the Willis Company who after probably three, four years of making a whippet, realized they could make more money making Jeeps for the government. Okay. But there were six whippets that somehow got to Detroit and were loaded on that boat. Now we know, and you think about it, if you're Walter Chrysler and you want your Chryslers back and your insurance company is gonna pay you or however you work it out, you're not gonna bring back somebody else's cars. So there were six. We were able to track down, and there's a picture in the book of one of them that had ultimately changed ownership and went to two gentlemen who owned what at that time was a boarding house, now was a, a, a tourist attraction place in Copper Harbor. So they had it, they passed it down. By the time we got a picture of it, it was in a shed and the shed was falling down. But it was sold and it existed after that. 
We also know that there are, if you ever get up to Calumet, uh, the Michigan Hotel, there are two whippet wheels on display in that hotel. So that's whippet number two. They had to come from somewhere. We talked to, if you, if you get into Copper Harbor and as you come down the hill, on your right, there's the Minnetonka Resort and they also have the Thunderbird Gift House. The lady who has that operation, Judy Davis, is also with the Historical Society up there. She told me the story, and she has a picture to prove it. She bought a whippet. She bought a whippet at an at a estate auction in Lorium and had it for years. So that's whippet number three. Now, we think we know where the remains of one are, and I've recently gotten a picture. Basically, it's the, the basics of the body and the engine, and it's being used to cut up firewood. Yeah. So we know, we know, we think we know where four of them went. Probably two of them went to a landfill somewhere, you know. But they sure didn't go back to Detroit to go to Toledo. You know. they, they became, like some of those crew members, they became permanent residents of the Keweenaw. If you have a question and wouldn't mind using the microphone so everybody can hear it, that would be great. One of our trips up to Copper Harbor, we met Paul Berg. I'm thinking Paul Berg is the father of the granddaughter that you spoke to. Uh huh. He had a friend here in Wausau. He gave me that address. And as far as I know, Paul probably died there. I don't know if he died in Copper Harbor or not. I don't know. But he told me this. He told us the story, just like you said. Really. About his father. But I don't know. I didn't know anything about the mother. But he told a story about his father really saving those cold, cold men. Right. And besides wiping up the floors, he said they try to find every blanket and thing to put on them because they were so cold. <laughs> Do you remember more of what he said? Yeah. Yeah. They were they were an amazing family, and you know, and they fed those those crewmen without knowing whether or not their, their food supplies would be replenished by spring. You know, you, the, the, you know the, uh, the Kroger truck didn't come up there once a week or whatever, you know. You prepared for the winter, and what you had is what you got until spring. So they were very generous to charge ahead and feed everybody and hope that it would work out, and it did. And his house where he lived was still there 20 years ago, but I know it's not there anymore. No, but it hasn't been gone that long. And there, is, there are two pictures of it in the book. And uh, I, the last time I was up there, the granddaughter had told me where it would be. And the land has since been sold, and there's this beautiful Huge. vacation home there, you know. Yeah. But uh, we, again, because of the granddaughter, were able to get the pictures of the home as it looked then with the snow and so forth. And that restaurant and lodging right by where the fort is, as you're going to, what's that part? Oh, uh, to Mariner? You're talking about the Mariner? In Copper Harbor, it's, it was called the Pines. When you go into the restaurant and the bar area, zillions of those pictures are are there too that probably are part of what you have in your book. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing that the family of the captain had saved them and allowed them to be used to, to show you know, what had happened up there. Do you know how many of the cars made it back to Walter? Do I know what? How many cars made it back to the Chrysler? Well, company? you know, that, at, at first I was convinced at least 200. You know, because we know 13 are in the lake. Uh, we know there were at least a few that stayed there. So I thought, over 200. Now, I and you know, I'll give you two, two missions yet uh, for this book. One is, of all the research I have done, and of all the people I've talked to, and all the archives, and there, there was at that time a newspaper in Calumet and they had written a couple stories about the cars are coming back and they're going to be loaded on the train and, 
and they're sending a crew up from Detroit that knows how to load them, etc. Do you think somebody would have taken a picture of a car on the train? I actually ran ads in the newspaper. I went to the archives everywhere to try to just get me one picture of one of those Chrysler's. It doesn't it didn't exist. It does in somebody's album somewhere. Grandpa drove one of those, you know, and, and here it is on the train. I couldn't find it. The other thing, to be more specific to answer your question, about a year ago, I got a copy, it was sent to me, of a very old publication. And the person who wrote it was from Lower Michigan, I think Midland, if I'm not mistaken. And he, his credentials were, he was a historian, he loved the Upper Peninsula. He wrote an article, and it was just a short article, that said there was a train wreck, and the train had cars on it that he presumed was from the banger. And the date that he gives for the train wreck matches when would have been the date, and I, and he said there were pictures taken. There were no pictures in that book in that article that he said. It was a page torn out of something that was sent to me. I actually tracked down his son in Midland and talked to him, and he said, yeah, Dad was loved the Upper Peninsula. He loved the Keweenaw. He wrote about it all the time. I said, do you know anything about this wreck? Or by chance, do you know, is there a picture? He said, I never heard the story before. I asked people, I... It, I've already written the book, so I mean, you know, what am I going to do with it? I was just curious, you know, maybe volume two, I don't know. I was unable, two missing pictures, we'll have to post a reward. One, car on a train, two, was there a train wreck? And he says in this little article, he said, and some of the cars were kept by the residents. So how many went back to Detroit? And the other thing that adds to the story, in researching, I said, well, contact the Chrysler Archives. Oh, great idea. Except, you know what? A few years ago, they all burned down. And, and I don't know if they'd have kept those records anyhow, because maybe they weren't real happy with that story. But there are no very old records of Chrysler official archives of them. Now I have talked to some uh, Chrysler enthusiasts who on their own have tried to accumulate old documents and pictures and that, but to no avail. <laughs> okay, so two, missing, two missing pictures, uh, we'll put a reward out for them. <laughs> Don't quit I, now, this okay. is fun, yeah. I'm curious how you got to know about it. Where did you where did you live and how did you get out? Well, okay, I, two, two or three things in my life. First of all, I'm what they call an old news dog. I was in radio, television, newspaper news, okay? Um, I was in Green Bay in the uh, 19, early 1970s, and one of my favorite tasks was to go up and cover the, the copper mine. The Calumet Heckler copper mine strikes, okay? I fell in love with Copper Harbor. Um, later, uh, got involved in snowmobiling up there. Long story on that. But anyhow, I got addicted to the Keweenaw. And every time I got a chance, we'd go up to the Keweenaw on vacation. Even though I'm living most of the time now in Louisiana, I get back here, I'm going to the Keweenaw. In fact, we're going to be up there this coming week. So how did I find the story? I'm up there, what, three years ago, and looking through some tourist publications, and there's about this much of a story about this ship that crashed off of Copper Harbor. I looked on the shipwreck maps. I, looked, I can't find anything about it. So I started asking questions. You know, it wasn't exactly a secret but they sure didn't talk about it much. The first, one of the first places I went was to the archives in Michigan Tech. 
That's not far away. That's 40 miles from Copper Harbor. The first lady, I shouldn't say this because it makes them look bad, but I got to tell you this story. The first lady I talked to, and I've talked to her many times since, so we're still friends. When I told her what I was looking for, she said, I've never heard of that. Now, she's in the archives at Michigan Tech, 40 miles away, and never heard the story. She said, let me see what I can find out. Well, fortunately, somebody else on her staff had heard about the story. And uh, they knew where to research it. They got some base. They got me the information, the picture that shows in the book of, of uh, Mr. Patty with the car standing alongside the car. This is my car. They found that for me. Also, I have to tell you this, the, the picture on the front of the book, that's a painting. That's an original painting, and how that happened, well, once I got addicted to this story, I said, I've, I've, we've got to have something that really tells a story. I found an, a good old Finlander artist up in the Keweenaw, a very talented artist, and, and we credit him in the book. And he created that painting for me, for the book. I mean, obviously I paid him, he didn't do it as a favor, and he still has the original painting. but. He created, he would, he would uh, email me what he was working on and I'd email him back. I'd say, well, you're close, Clyde, but, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We finally got a finished product, uh, turned it over to my graphic artist, and she made a cover out of it. And so it's, uh, that's how badly I got addicted to this story. <laughs> I actually hired an artist to create the cover. And by the way, there's a sticker on it. I'm going to brag a little bit now. Last year, 2022, the Authors and Publishers Association in the Upper Peninsula voted this one of the 10, they call it Notable Books of the Year. So that made me feel good. <laughs> so uh, there's just so much more I, I wish I could do with it, and who knows, there may be a volume two. Questions, the lady back there had a question. I'm from Detroit, so I find this really You're from where? I'm from Detroit, so I find this very interesting. And I'm guessing that you would have checked the archives of the Detroit papers. I would have thought in Motor City, this would have been a big I story. Call, I, that's what I thought. I thought there would have been an article in the paper when the cars came back. I talked to archives in Detroit. I talked to um, newspapers. You know, is there anything in your morgue, with any pictures, any stuff? Nothing. I couldn't find a thing in Detroit. So maybe that's item number three. Yeah, we'll that's, that's incredible. I just, I, even if they were trying to keep it secret later, well, I would the, shipwreck The press would have found it. The only thing I was able to gain on that research is I did get a lot of information about the Nicholson Company. That was the marine, maritime company that owned the ships. They had a lot of information on them. In fact, how many ships they had, how they grew. Uh, they had a, a facility down along the river where they would load the cars onto the boats. I got all that from Detroit. But you think that they would have followed up? You know, the cars are back. Look at guys. You know, it, it's the same thing in Calumet, only on the other end. You know, no pictures, nothing. You know. It's, just a there's, uh, and now we're talking about the Nicholson company that had all these ships, all these steamers. I also wrap up in the end of the book a story about a ship that was owned by the Nicholsons that was called the Senator. And two years, boy, he was, he was not having a good run of luck. Two years after the banger, the Senator was hauling a load of Nashes from Kenosha headed north up Lake Michigan, got into a, a very bad storm and a very bad collision with an ore boat coming down from Escanaba. Well, again, it's the story of a heavy boat and a light boat. And the ore boat caused that Nicholson boat to go to the bottom in less than 10 minutes. And it unfortunately, it took six, the captain and five crewmen with him. But on the bottom of Lake Michigan, and I've got a, a very blurry picture, there is a spot that's got 200 and some Nash automobiles 
again, we're sitting on the bottom of the Great Lakes, and it has been referred to as the world's largest Nash Museum. <laughs> And that story is in the book, because I just, what, what triggered that is one of the reporters from Detroit who had been following this story had, had thought, heard of some other incidents of car carriers getting into trouble on the Great Lakes. And he wrote in one of his articles, he said, that must be a jinx. Those car carriers on the Great Lakes, they have to be jinxed. So I thought that, that's a cute way to kind of end this thing. And I, tracked down the second Nicholson ship that went to the bottom. I, I was just wondering, how, how did those, all those guys that drove those cars to Calumet get back? How did what? <laughs> I was wondering how those guys that drove the, all those cars from Copper Harbor well, to Calumet they were at, Most of them were from Calumet. And because, you know, how many people have you gotten oh, okay. in, in, in Copper Harbor? So a lot of the high school boys were from Calumet okay. and others along the way. So they were hauled, they had to get they were hauled up okay. there and then they All right. brought them back. Yeah, I don't think there would have been enough people. There were a few people in Copper Harbor okay. that, that took on that task, but not many. Okay. Thanks. I was just going to say, Calumet alone is the capital. Calumet was it was. At one time, Calumet was the second largest city in, in Michigan. Right, right. It was, it was a fabulous city. Um, you know, and again, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story that has nothing to do with the shipwreck, but again, I think it really does have something to do with the people in the Keweenaw. Several years um, after, the, in fact, after the, the Calumet and Hecla copper strike, there was an airport built between Hancock and Calumet. And North Central DC-9s were flying into that airport. So I'm up there with a the camera crew and we're looking for stories to do. We get into downtown Calumet and someone says, there's a guy over here who's got a heck of a project going on. So we, we go and we find the guy. He's got three of the old buildings on the main street of Kelly. I'm trying to think of the name of the street, but anyhow. Um, he's got three old buildings. And he's in there knocking down walls and just got talking to him. He said, what are, you, what are you doing? He said, I'm making them all. I make, do you know there's an airport? out here now, not too far from Calumet. And the big DC-9s are coming in from Detroit. I'm gonna get this mall ready because those people are gonna come from Detroit and they're gonna shop here. <laughs> now, if that's not Keweenaw courage and determination, I don't know what is. Anybody else? We could do Finlander stories all day if you want to, you know. I love them, they're great people. I'm sorry. Is your book here or is it? Yeah, it's there. It's also at the bookstore in town. Thanks to Jane. <laughs> okay, you. well, yep, I was just about to say can we have a round of applause for uh, Larry? Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. It's, it's been fun, and I'll hang around if you want to do some, something where nobody else is listening. We can do that too. <laughs>